This Marquee Dragon video is sponsored by Shattered Crystal, game codes and items. Hello, I'm Marcus Eikenberry, and this is Richard Garriott with me. Now, Richard, you, um, I don't know if you, are you famous for having gone to space? You know, uh, I, I would have to say yes uh, at this point. It's, uh, as it turns out, there's so few people who have flown privately uh, that, uh, that that has now become one of the you know, most common things I'm asked about or uh, asked to speak on the subject of, or things like that, so yeah. So now when you say privately, it's because you're not a NASA astronaut, you're a private citizen that went to the space station, correct? Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, my father is a NASA government astronaut, uh, but uh, when I was a teenager, I was told by NASA that because I had poor eyesight, I wasn't able to become a NASA astronaut. So I, I became devoted to the privatization of space from a very young age. And uh, by uh, extraordinary good luck and a great deal of perseverance, uh, we, uh, myself and a, a, a group of us, uh, co-conspirators, uh, managed to build a civilian space flight agency, you might call it, mm -hmm. a company called Space Adventures. And we've flown eight flights, seven people. Uh, one guy went twice. Uh, to go live on the space station for two weeks at a time. That's pretty amazing. So, what, um, now you mentioned that your father is an astronaut. And uh, is his name Owen? Owen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, Owen Garriott. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can Google him. Yep. And um, so, tell me what that was like growing up with um, your father being an astronaut. Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, not only was my father an astronaut, but literally my left and right neighbors were also astronauts. And so as a child, uh, of course, you, you, you don't know what to compare it against, so it mm. seemed perfectly normal so at the time. Yes, absolutely normal. But, uh, but now I can reflect on it and realize how not normal it was. Uh, but my father was always bringing home techno experiments. And uh, they were things like a, uh, uh, an aluminum photomultiplier tube, which is basically a night vision scope. Oh, okay. But this is before there was anything called night vision. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or he would bring home a pair of glasses with prisms in it that would reverse left and right because they were doing studies on brain plasticity for adapting to living in zero-g versus the ground. And one of the things they had discovered is that if you put these glasses on people or cats or really anything, after two or three days of having your vision appear left, right, backwards, your brain will correct it. Oh. Then the problem is when you take off the glasses, you have reverse <laughs> vision for two or three days until your brain corrects it. Interesting. And, uh, and these are kind of, the, we would play with these toys all the time. So my dad was constantly bringing home these, these experiments, you might call them. And so that life of uh, scientific curiosity was just, uh, you know, ingrained into our everyday existence. Would you say that some of this um, maybe inspired some of your creativity with your video game making? Oh, unquestionably. You know, in fact, uh, you know, I'm also an avid explorer personally. Uh, and that, that, that sense of, uh, that passion for exploration, uh, that passion for scientific discovery uh, absolutely shows up in my games and, so, and sometimes obvious and sometimes subtle ways like the and the subtle ways are actually are better but they're harder to describe but it's, you know some of the some of the more obvious ones are things like uh, uh, you know I'm fascinated with mechanical oraries and so Ultima's constantly included these uh, you know not only movements of heavenly bodies in the star systems but often mechanical oraries in the game but, and, and just as importantly and often a connection between the movements of the planets through the heavens and going ons, uh, you know, uh, that was foretelling the future of what was happening on the game itself. And so I just used those, those mechanics to be, uh, you know, instead of the bad guy showing up randomly at a town to go kill people, he would show up based on the pattern of the movement of the heavens. Oh, interesting. Uh, and so uh, that way the player could eventually d deduce it as well. So it, mm. it, it uh, gave the magic or it gave the AI, you know, some uh, myth mystical meaning, but it, it really comes out of that passion for uh, scientific discovery. So you were probably doing this as a kid, seeing all of these things and, and figuring it all out, and um, it was a grand puzzle. Yeah, and that's still the way I look at the Earth. You know, it's, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, I, I find to this day I have a, a, a passion or a sickness uh, beyond what most other people I meet are, sickness. <laughs> which is that <laughs> if I ever see around me a physical structure or object that I don't know what it is or what it's for or how it operates, it actually bothers me until I stop and you know, figure it out. And uh, 
And so literally I'll have friends, we'll be, we'll be walking along the side of the street and there'll be a, you know, a, a, a box or a piece of hardware you know, on, on, the, on the sidewalk or attached to a building. And, and I'll literally, I'll stop and we'll study it for a while. And we've got like, what in the world is that? And, and you know, I don't, don't feel uh, good until I know better. For example, here's a contemporary example. I, I, uh, my fiance lives in, in New York. So I spend a lot of time now in New York. And on the streets of New York, about every fourth or fifth block, there will be a nitrogen cylinder and a hose running off this nitrogen distiller into a manhole cover into the ground. And, you know, so, so one or two of those I wasn't too, you know, concerned with, but as soon as I realized they were there for months mm -hmm. and they're really all over New York, I went, okay, well, then somebody must know. I mean, this is, you know, why in the world is this out here? None of it's labeled. All the other New Yorkers walk by it every day. Nobody seems to be bothered by it. I ask friends or family going, yeah, I've seen those too. I really don't know what they're for. And I'm going, what do you mean you've seen them and you see them all over the place, but you don't know what they're for? Why, do, why doesn't this bother you? And uh, it's, it's interesting what it's for, since I've figured out what they're for. What they're for is they're put in by all the new uh, telcos that are doing high-speed data networks. Oh. And the, uh, the way they detect leaks, uh, you know, if there's any water that gets into their cables, it'll call corrosion, cause corrosion, and therefore interrupt the data flow. And so they pressurize the inner jacket of these data cables with nitrogen. And so eventually I presume that they'll bury all this stuff but their hacked solution to keeping the data flow through the city of New York operational is to put giant, you know, and replace regularly nitrogen canisters all over the city. Huh. It's a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid. <laughs> it's a data, it's a, it's a broadband Band-Aid. Was there um, anything that inspired you about your father with, um, with what your eventual uh, making it to space? Well, I think that um, you know, if you if you talk to any person, especially or really any, any child for sure, but frankly, almost any person would tell you, you know, if you had the chance to go into space, would you? And the answer, is, you know, eighty percent of all people say yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask any kid, what the things they find most fascinating are, you know, the two classic examples are space and dinosaurs. And so, the fact that I had a childhood interest in space is not unusual. I think it's you know extraordinarily common. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think that most people grow up and get over it, you know, so to speak. They, uh, they either realize they have, it, they have a stronger passion in something else and or they realize that the probability is so low it's just not worth pursuing. Um, in my case, growing up within it and with it around having a father was so into it, I think first of all that eliminated one of the options. I mean, that, that, that meant that the reason to give up was not because it wasn't going to be possible. Right. You know what I mean? You, you at least knew that it was a plausible thing to have occur uh, because everybody I knew did go to space. You know, all the, all the parental figures either were astronauts or people involved in putting people into space in one way or another. And then it was the, uh, it was the doctor at NASA who inadvertently, very flippantly, told me that because you have poor eyesight, you don't get to go, who didn't realize the, the, how entrenched he was making me. Uh, because that, that was like being told, you are no longer eligible to be a member of the club that your father and all your neighbors are a member of. And so that was, you know, he just did it flippantly because he didn't assume, you know, most everybody can't go to space, so it's, it's no big deal to be told right. you can't go. Uh, for me, however, it was, it was a crushing blow. And so I spent a, you know, a couple of days just feeling crushed that, you know, like, wow, I'm, I, don't, I'm not, I don't get to, nothing I can do. I, I was assumed I was gonna go. I assumed everybody was gonna go. And now I'm being told everybody gets to go except you. You're not eligible. And, uh, and after a couple of days of feeling sorry for myself, in ways that most people probably wouldn't have noticed. Um, I said, well, look, you know, who, are, who, who is that doctor to be the gatekeeper of who eventually goes into space? If I can't go with NASA, I'll have to go on my own. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the age of 13, that didn't seem like it would be very hard. Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me about your, um, uh, the process you went through to, um, to, to realize your dream. You know, what, what did you... What did you have to give up to get there? Well, of course, travel in space is uh, not easy on a number of levels. Um, first of all, there's not very many technical capabilities to reach space. I mean, there's the United States government, there's been the Russian government, more recently the Chinese government, and only very, very, very recently a couple of, well, one suborbital vehicle that has made it into space uh, independently. So there's really, in the history of humanity, there has only been four uh, ways to get into space, three of which have been governments. So first of all, it's not easy. But what I, so the, the way I broke this open is, you know, early on, 
uh, my first investments. In fact, with the money I was making in the early Ultima series, my first computer games, I made my first big investments into companies that were intending to open the space frontier for civilians. Uh, my first uh, big investment was a company called Spacehab. And Spacehab uh, was making a, uh, a pressurized uh, container for inside the shuttle payload bay. And they did actually produce these, but their hopes were to basically put double-decker bus kind of seating in them to be able to fly civilians. Oh. And so that's my, that's my ticket to space. I'm investing. Uh, I, that was my first big investment. That was their first big investor. Uh, however, they, they did make these devices. But of course, the part that hadn't been asked when I made that investment is, is NASA going to be willing to fly civilians in this way? And the answer was absolutely not. Mm. And so, That'd you know, be a problem. That'd be a problem. <laughs> Uh, and I invested behind a number of other what I'll call astronaut or prime contractor based endeavors. And so for the first 10 years I learned the hard way that people who are in the governmental aerospace industry, and especially people like astronauts, you know, astronauts are hired as astronauts because they're either great scientists or great test pilots. Mm. Not because they are great entrepreneurs and not because they are great what I'll call politicians who could change the national plan for the space program. You know what I mean? And so those were largely a waste of time. Uh, it wasn't until you know, almost 20 years into my dreams of going to space that I met with a group of like-minded entrepreneurs, mostly coming from the high-tech industry, like myself, who put together a plan that cracked it open. And we first started by creating something called the X Prize, which was a $10 million prize that we put together for the first private vehicle that flew into space, and that worked. So after the United States and Russia, or actually, actually Russia first, then the United States, then China, then the X Prize. Uh, was the first private vehicle that ever flew into space. Um, we then went on to charter, you know, while waiting for the suborbital vehicles to become available commercially, we got tired of waiting. And we just said, look, let's just go on and fly to orbit. Let's see what will take us. And, you know, we've talked to China and the United States and Russia, and basically everybody told us no. But the no we got from Russia was no, because to find out if it would be possible on how we would train them and how much it would cost and how we could do all this safely would cost us a lot of money to even know how to answer your question. Mm. And so we're not even willing to research the question. However, that's a qualified yes in my mind. Absolutely. Life. And so that's I an actually, objection which can be... Yes. And so I actually yeah. paid for that study myself oh. because knowing that that was going to be the only way I was going to get into space. And so... Um, uh, uh, tragically, however, right after I paid for the study and we got the price back and it was exactly what we expected, that's when the internet stock market crashed and mm. with it went all my wealth. And so I sold what was originally slated to be my seat to fly to the International Space Station to a gentleman named Dennis Tito who became the first private citizen to fly in space. And then I had to go back and rebuild my wealth and eventually managed to pull it off. So that would be something really big that you gave up in your journey there. Yes, well, so <laughs> yeah, so think about it this way. So first, First, you invest in this company, Spacehab, because they believe they've got to make what happen. They make these containers, but NASA says no. So, ride it up, hopes dashed. Then you actually bring into the capability the existence of civilian space vehicles, and you get the Russians to agree to pay for it. You've paid a lot of money even to get that answer. Stock market crashed. There, go, there goes your hopes. Then you go to the third time. Third time, which eventually worked. However, as soon as I put down money, there's another big stumbling block, which is that just because you've negotiated the rights, just because you've managed to pull together enough money to pay for this incredibly expensive activity, still doesn't mean they'll let you. You still have to pass the medical tests. Mm. And as it turns out, most normal humans won't pass the medical tests. And, uh, and nor would I. In fact, uh, I had two very serious things show up. One is I have two fused kidneys. And that we knew about. I have both my kidneys are on the same side and interconnected. Interesting. Fortunately for me, an astronaut has already flown with that same anomaly. Oh, okay. It was before they had the CAT scan capability of knowing. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, we'll let you fly with that. It's abnormal. If we didn't have any other case studies, it might be a bigger problem. But the fact that somebody's done it before and didn't seem to have any trouble, off you go. But then they also found something called a hemangioma on my liver. And what that is, is your liver has lobes, each lobe being defined by an artery feeding one section and a vein draining that section. Okay. And I had one artery that, that did not have a matching vein. And so one lobe of my liver was basically a dead-end blockage. Hmm. And, and as it turns out, that's not uncommon. About 10% of all people have something similar. But most people don't go to space. 
And if you go to space, and therefore you might have a rapid depressurization of a spacecraft in case of an accident, uh, that depressurization could, could create internal bleeding, which you could neither detect, nor even if you could detect, fix. Right. And so therefore it would be fail. And so they said, Richard, if you want to go to space, you have to have that piece of your liver removed. And so I have a scar that goes from my sternum wow. down to my belly button and all the way over here to the side where uh, they uh, cut me open to remove one-sixth of my liver. Which was the, that's, wow. a, that's how devoted to that's flying dedication. I am. That's dedication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know the cameras can't see, well, this camera can see it, so. Uh, <laughs> so but yeah, but see, here's my, here's my nice little scar. Wow. From uh, a memento of my, uh, my trip to space. So when I asked you what you gave up to go, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, and in addition to that, you know, it, and people know it's, it's expensive, uh, mm -hmm. but I literally did invest basically all of my net worth. I had heard and, that. I had heard that. And so, um, and, and that's why I knew that you had given up a lot to, to realize this dream. But, you know, but for me it was, you know, and people often go like, how could you possibly do that? I mean, how could it possibly be worth that? And to me it was like, it wasn't an issue of the money, you know, in other words, I was, you know, my, my father was devoted enough to it to where he took the government low paying job and never became wealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I took it from the other perspective. If I was getting wealthy with the explicit purpose of in turning that wealth into a trip to space, which I did. And so, uh, you know, I don't think my sacrifice was any worse than my dad's by any means. Mm -hmm. So uh, now this is all documented, right? Is this is this all in your uh, it is. documentary that it was is. made about this? It is. In fact, we've made a, a very fortuitously. Uh, I was actually at a friend's wedding uh, six months or so before I started my training, mm -hmm. and uh, I was talking to some mutual friends of ours who happen to be documentary filmmakers. And when I was describing what I was about to go do, they were like. They, they were like, Richard, why didn't you tell you, us about this? Well, right? are you taking any cameras with you? I mean, what are you, what are you doing to document this? At the very least for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing to document this? And I went, oh, I actually hadn't even got around to that level of planning. And they said, well, Richard, you know, please allow us to follow you on this journey. And so they did. So they, uh, so starting from about six months before I even started any of my training, uh, I had a documented film crew basically following me 24 hours a day. And, uh, and then also in the cases they couldn't be with me, like inside the spacecraft, uh, we had set up very uh, a lot of uh, photographic equipment and procedures to to capture the whole uh, beginning to end journey. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Now that um, that's called uh, Man on a Mission. Man on a Mission. Man exactly. On a mission. And uh, is that available yet on DVD it, or what's it's the It's not yet that? available. It's it's interesting. There's actually uh, uh, it. It probably will air this fall on what I call regular television, mm. uh, but there is also now a significant uh, interest from what I will call a live action recreation of it as well. So you never know; you might even see a, a movie uh, oh, okay. you know, based on the story. Okay. So we'll, we'll see. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Uh, another way to fund another trip. I, hope so. <laughs> I sure hope so. That would be nice. That yeah. would be nice. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty cool. So um, I think that that your journey. To, to make it to space, which is all these, you know, all of us kids dream about that, mm -hmm. um, could really be seen as an inspiration for, um, for many of us who thought, who gave it up as a kid. Wait, well, here's what I find very interesting about it too. So you, you look at the way I went and you go, it still required a great deal of good fortune. I mean, mm -hmm. at a number of levels. I mean, it's good fortune I could eventually afford it. Uh, it's also good fortune that it, the plan worked. You know, I mean, the fact that uh, the X Prize was won, and it's good fortune that the Russians eventually said yes. And uh, you know, there's all these there's just an incredible number of good fortune moments that had to have occurred. And so, even today, for somebody to go, gee, I can go if I only raise fifty million dollars. You know, that still will seem pretty remote, uh, probabilistically. What's interesting though is to see what's happening now, even since then. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of people who are the way I describe it is, you know, the Apollo era inspired tons of people to believe in the 2001 vision of the future, mm -hmm. uh, the Stanley Kubrick 2001 version. Never happened. But what did happen is a ton of people went into STEM education activities. In other words, science, technology, engineering, and math became cool during the Apollo era. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us that are in the high tech industry now can trace our high tech interest to Back the Apollo to era. Interesting. What's also interesting about that is now let's look what's happening. 
you have people like me who are not only still doing high tech, but now do space. John Carmack, the author of Doom and Quake. What does he do now? He makes rockets that fly to space. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com. You know what he does? He has a company called Blue Origin. They make rockets. How about Elon Musk, the founder of PayPal and Tesla Motor Cars? He has a company called SpaceX. He's already flown his rockets into space. Uh, and we'll soon be taking crew and then cargo and is working now with us. Even the prime contractors like Boeing and uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation and uh, uh, United Launch Alliance, a bunch of these other companies that have been doing work for NASA are now also competing privately to create vehicles to take just you and me and anybody else to space. The point of this is there is a new space race that is underway largely based on people in our field mm -hmm. uh, who are circling back to space uh, as kind of uh, to fulfill the dreams of their childhood uh, that were not fulfilled by the traditional means and are now saying, I want to do the same thing, I want to make the same revolution happen now with space as we do with computers. So, so where do you think um, we're going with this? I mean, I mean, I know that we're going to space, but um, what does it look like 10 years from now? Um, so here's kind of my forecast, uh, which is that in the next five years, you're going to see what I will call the barnstorming era of suborbital. And whether it's the vehicle that Richard Branson is buying from our XPRIZE uh, competitors, the, a plane that can go to space and back, um, there's another company called XCOR that's doing another plane to space and back, John Carmack is doing his vertical takeoff, vertical landing vehicle that goes to space. Uh, there's a company called Maston, which also uh, it will be doing a vertical takeoff, vertical landing vehicle. Uh, and I probably missed somebody. Blue Origin is doing one. So I, I may have already just mentioned six companies. And there's probably a few I haven't mentioned. They're doing suborbital. Uh, all of which, or mo at least half of those, are, are well funded. And so there's no question in my mind that they'll make it probably in two or three years. But give it till five before we have all of them working and there's this kind of competition between them. And so within five years, for the price of a, a basically a first class round the world ticket, you should be able to go to space. And anyone on earth who is well educated and gets a good job should be able to save enough money to buy one first class ticket around the world if they really thought that was their dream. Once in their lifetime. Once in their lifetime. Yeah. So space in now in our lifetimes will easily be within everyone's reach as a once in a lifetime goal. However, that's only for six minutes in space. That's straight up, float up for six minutes, minutes and wow. come back down. So it's a pretty short trip, mm -hmm. but it's space. And the view is spectacular, I can tell you that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but then you go, okay, well now how about, how about going to orbit? So the next big goal is orbit. The problem with orbit is for space, you just have your, your peak velocity at the top is zero miles an hour. To go to orbit and not come back down, you have to go 17,000 miles an hour, which means you re-enter going 17,000 miles an hour. Mm. And the energy to friction ratio, you know, the amount of energy you have to burn off basically is a, you know, a 25 multiple, uh, 25 times multiple compared to a suborbital vehicle. Uh, and so it's just an enormously more difficult problem. Mm -hmm. And so the cost is not going to be that cheap. It's, there's, you know, right now with NASA, you know, we, we, we pay hundreds of millions of dollars to send an astronaut to space. On the Russian Soyuz, the one I took, it costs about $50 million right now. Uh, but most of the private vehicle makers believe they'll get it down into the ones of millions. Well, the important part about getting it down to the ones of millions of dollars to go to space is that I would have been profitable with my own trip to space. Because I tried to do as much work as I could to offset the high crop price of my trip. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so when the price gets down to ones of millions, there's lots of us who are going to go, not because you're going on vacation with your pocket money. You're going to go because you can do work in you're space gonna, you're gonna work that will pay for it. That will pay for your trip. And so it won't mean everybody gets to go, but it'll be like an oil uh, rig. You know, we put people on an oil rig that's very expensive to put them out there. They have to helicopter them in and out and it's dangerous and very expensive. But we do it because we're taking out oil. Well, the same thing's true for space. There's, lots of, there's plenty of value in space once you get the price down to about a million or five million bucks. The question you asked was, what about the next 10 years? So the next 10 years, five years, barnstorming suborb suborbital vehicles, 10 years commercial crew to stations in low earth orbit uh, that are profitable. But then you go, okay, well how about the moon or Mars or asteroids? And that won't be within 10 years. And, but the previous national plan was a 30 year plan to go back to Mars, to, to go to Mars for example. But it was a 30 year plan that also could not have worked. Uh, it would have had to triple or pentuple the NASA budget for 30 years to pull it off. And no one's gonna increase the budget that much for that period of time. And that would be if it ran on time and on budget. You know? So it, it was a non-workable plan. 
But the plan that I see brewing now, which I'm a big proponent of and seems to get be gaining momentum, is imagine a plan where, just like we had the X Prize that brought a uh, space vehicle at all into existence, and now there's a Google Lunar X Prize to put a private rover on the moon that'll be one in the next two, three, four years. Imagine doing another X Prize to put uh, things on Mars. But the things you put there are very specific. The, you put prizes together to do things like put a robot on Mars that sequesters oxygen and just stores it in tanks over and over and over and over and over again until the cows come out. You put another rover, another prize together that says go to Mars and build radiation hardened igloos that people could live in. Just put another prize together that says go build greenhouses and actually have things grow inside them. And only once you've built enough of this what I call infrastructure you do you send people. And the, you can do that so much more cost effectively. It's a, you know, a tenth to a hundredth the price of a big national plan. That uh, this will allow us to uh, reach, moon, re reach the moon or Mars uh, really much more quickly, something more closer to 20 years and 30 years. 30 years would be, should be easy. Uh, and my favorite way is to go one way. So you send homesteaders. Oh. You don't send people to come back. And that's even easier yet. <laughs> half price. <laughs> or less. It's actually considerably less than half price. So, Richard, thank you very much. Um, I hope maybe one day I can make it to space. Of course you and, will. Of uh, course you will. Uh, I think it'll be a, a fun journey, and uh, thank you for helping to pave the way. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm so glad I had the opportunity.